Greetings to those who watch below. It's that time of the month where we check out some truly creepy paranormal tales, but before we start, I'd like to say thank you to Steffi Ray, Lisa Watts, Lefty Kim, M.A. Way, Julie B., Christina Groves, Chris BLK Chris, Canopsia, Tegan S., Tasos Karamaris, LT Punisher 666, and Wicked Witch, for being those who dwell below. An exclusive channel membership that you can check out using the link in the description box. For social media, you can find me on Instagram at brimstone underscore below, and on Facebook at Brimstone Below Horror Channel. Also, I'm over on the creepypasta.com official YouTube channel, where I'm just about to start a new five part series, so make sure you check that out. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Paranormal Phenomena at Railway Track by Discerning User Railway tracks are often said to be a hotspot for paranormal activities, hauntings, etc. The reason is quite simple. Many people die in a very violent and sudden manner when they are mowed down by trains. Such violent, traumatic deaths are bound to greatly disturb the natural order of the surrounding environment by its negative vibrations, causing what we term as hauntings. Those who live in the Mumbai central suburbs would know that the long stretch of railway tracks between Bandup and Mulland is considered especially haunted. Many people have witnessed paranormal phenomena in this site over the years. Due to the burgeoning population of the nearby town, a small new railway station named Nahur was built in 2006 between Bandup and Mulland. The incident of which I'm about to relate took place in 2016, when I was working in Andheri, a western suburb in Mumbai. Sometimes I would work at office until very late, and then rush to catch the last metro train to the central suburb of Ghatkapar. Then I would catch a late night local train and alight at Nahur, after which I would walk down to the highway to get a bus to my neighbourhood. There is a narrow path that one has to take to reach the highway, and it runs parallel to the railway tracks, with a fence separating it. On the other side of the path is a heavily wooded stretch. The path is almost half a kilometre long, and ends in stone steps which one has to climb to reach the highway. On this particular day, it was an hour past midnight when I got down at Nahur station. Nobody else got off the train and the station itself was totally deserted, which wasn't unusual for that time of the day. However, when I climbed up the stairs of the bridge to gain the pathway, I could see a stray dog restlessly pacing on the bridge. When I started climbing down the stairs, the dog followed me and kept following when I started walking along the path. It was then quite evident to me that the dog wanted to go to the highway, but was afraid to go alone and therefore was looking for some company. There were no lights on the path, and the moon itself was not shining very brightly. In addition, it had rained and there were puddles of water everywhere. The dog stayed almost at my heels, never passing me and never taking the lead. From time to time, I could hear it whimpering softly, a solitary train roared past without stopping, momentarily lighting up the surroundings. I had almost reached the steps leading to the highway, when I could see a small black lump lying on the ground a few metres from me. I took out my phone and switched on the torch to see better. It was a dead crow, and as I drew nearer, I could see that it was badly mutilated. One of its wings was broken and stretched out, its body was crushed, and some of its guts had also spilled out. I carefully stepped around it, taking care not to tread on it. The dog was whimpering at a feverish pitch, and that puzzled me, as dead crows are not uncommon. I had taken a few steps ahead when I heard a coarse squawk behind me. I turned around in surprise to see the dead crow spring to life and take off, fluttering its wings wildly. As soon as it crossed the fence and flew over the railway tracks, it completely and inexplicably disappeared. I blinked my eyes in astonishment, and my shocked mind tried hard to make sense of what had just happened. The dog, which was so far slinking behind me, decided that it had enough. Its nerve broke, and with a howl, it ran past me and sprinted up the steps as if the devil himself was at its heels. The dog's action broke my reverie, and I swiftly walked up to the end of the path and started climbing. I didn't run up the steps though, because several of them were broken, 
and slipping on them was the last thing that I wanted, I reached the highway safely. All this happened in the space of about 10 to 12 seconds. The rest of my way home was quite uneventful, however, to this day, I cannot forget the strange incident. It still gives me goosebumps whenever I recollect it. I've used the same path several times after this incident, both during the daytime and at night. Once, I struck up a conversation with a middle-aged fellow who sits on the stairs and sells buttermilk. I asked him if he ever witnessed anything strange, and he told me that eunuch prostitutes used the wooded stretch to service their customers. Once, a gang of drug addicts assaulted and murdered one such eunuch in the woods, close to where I experienced the strange phenomena. They left the body to rot, and crows and dogs devoured it. Since then, dead crows and dogs are frequently found in those woods. The buttermilk vendor himself would always wind up his business at 9pm and never stay behind for a minute more. Unmarked Graves Found After Lots of Ghostly Activity by KLH834 The farmhouse I lived in growing up is quite haunted. It started with small things, like objects disappearing from obvious places only to be found in abnormal areas where no one else would ever think to put them. For example, I came home from school, dropped my bag on the kitchen table and went to change for work. When I came back to grab my bag, it was missing. I looked in all the obvious places where I might have left it. My bedroom, the living room, etc. As a last ditch, frustrated attempt to find it, I peeked inside my parents' room. I was not allowed in my parents' room, so I didn't expect to see it there. But there it was, sitting in the middle of their bed. I also heard noises at night of our kitchen cupboards opening and closing, the garage door opening when I knew it was locked for the night, the doorbell, which almost no one used, would go off whenever I was home alone, with no one at the other side of the door and no footprints in the snow. My mum was sceptical of my experiences and pretty much never believed me, until one day I was talking to my sister about what I experienced and my mum asked me that if the house was really haunted, who did I think was haunting it? I can't quite explain the feeling that came over me as I answered her, but when I told her who it was, it felt like it wasn't me saying it, even though it was my voice. I told her it was an older, angry man and his six-year-old son. I had no way of knowing if that was true, and to this day, I have no idea where that came from. Later on that week, my mum was visited at work by a lady who claimed she was with some surveying group looking to map the location of unmarked graves. Someone in our small town of 1200 people had sent this lady to my mum when she was trying to find the owners of our land. She told my mum that there seemed to be two unmarked graves on our land, just beside our house. My mum froze and asked the lady if she knew whose graves they were. The lady told her that they were the graves of a 42-year-old man and his six-year-old son, who both died of scarlet fever. She believed every story I told her after that. Fast forward a few years, and my husband and I came back to visit my parents and stayed in the downstairs bedroom overnight. As I lay in bed, trying to fall asleep, I looked towards the corner of the room and saw a white mist, floating there, almost like a cloud of smoke that wouldn't dissipate. I stared at it for a long time, until it started to move towards me. It stopped right beside me on my side of the bed. I was so scared. I rolled over and wrapped my arms around my sleeping husband and buried my face in his back, hoping it would go away. That's when I started to feel something playing with my ponytail, slowly pulling on it and flipping the hair. I started to cry and whispered, Stop it! And immediately my hair went flat on the bed. I thought it was over, until something started touching my back. It's hard to explain the feeling. In my head, I knew it was a finger, poking me on my right shoulder, all around my tattoo. But it didn't really feel like a solid finger. I shook my husband and called his name, crying my eyes out. He rolled over and mumbled something and went back to sleep. When I looked again, the mist was gone. 
In the morning, I was telling my story to my sister. I was wearing a tank top, so you could see my right shoulder and my tattoo. As I told her about the finger, she walked behind me, and when she looked at me, she froze. She asked, where was the finger poking you? I said, on my right shoulder, and she said, oh my god, go look in the mirror. I did, and what I found sent chills down my spine. All around my tattoo, right where the finger was poking me, were small, circular bruises. I don't sleep in that bedroom anymore, when I go home to visit. My Family's Haunted House by Pilot Paul Springfield was one of a row of three cottages built by my great-great-grandfather on Locks Road, which was then a quiet country lane in a small village on the south coast of Hampshire. The initial white painted detached house, known as Dorcas Cottage, was my great-great-grandfather's family home, with the two other pairs of Edwardian semis built later for his sons, one of whom was my great-grandfather. Dorcas Cottage was born from tragedy, being named after my great-grandfather's sister, who was murdered by her boyfriend on a railway bridge in a nearby lane. Soon after, there were two more tragedies. In the early 1900s, my grandmother's four-year-old brother Joe fell into a copper boiler and died from scalding, followed a few years later by her mother dying a slow and painful death at the hands of the consumption. Some 50 years later, my father, not being one for superstition or the paranormal, was shocked to see what he strongly believed to be a semi-transparent apparition of a lady in a white Edwardian type dress, drifting around the site of the tragedy. My grandmother also used to tell me that she did not like being in that vicinity when walking back to her house after visiting her brother and sisters late in the evening. I personally had a very similar experience some years later, with a sense of being watched and some very strange noises, bangs and rattles from inside an adjacent outbuilding. That haunted spot has since been developed and now accommodates a rather cramped new build house. The house had a host of strange goings on, with several occurrences in the early 2000s before the last of my family members moved out. My grandmother had sadly passed away, but I felt her presence had not entirely left the house, which by this time was now being lived in solely by my uncle and his wife. On one particular occasion, a visitor to the house was reversing and swore somebody had just walked behind the car into her reversing lights. When asked to describe who she'd seen, she described my grandmother in such detail that she even described her hair, posture, and the style and colour of her clothes. The witness had never met my grandmother, who had passed away a year or so previously. On another occasion, my wife and I were visiting my uncle and his wife, and were seated in his lounge. My uncle was standing in the doorway, discussing something controversial, which my grandmother would not have appreciated, when tremendous banging and shaking started from the staircase behind him. This could not be explained, but my uncle bizarrely ignored the unexplained noises. We later found out that his wife often used to hear my grandmother's voice calling her name in a scolding fashion, and was frankly petrified. A few months later, they sold up and moved out. We helped them move, and as they left the house for the final time, she closed her eyes, did not look back, and said, just get me out of here. We were recently discussing the strange experiences in the old house during a Christmas family party, at which, after years of denial, my uncle admitted that strange things had happened to him whilst he lived there. We all hated going upstairs after dark, as there would be a strange atmosphere, almost evil. My sister spoke of a time when she had a nightmare, in which she went through our great aunt's room in the house, only to be confronted by a boy in Edwardian clothes climbing through the window. She dismissed this as just a bad dream, until she visited our confused old great-aunt, who seemed to be very upset with her. When asked what was the matter, she snapped to my sister, Why did you come into my room with that boy the other night? My sister replied that she had not, only to be told, Yes, you did. You came through the window with that boy. That was over 25 years ago, and the experience still troubles my sister. K. 
Kiddo by Lovebug16. Me and my family live in an apartment somewhere in Cainta City, Philippines. The place is simple. It has a small kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, and a living area, which has enough space for all the furniture. We didn't have many things back then, so we decided to just sleep in the living room. We set up our TV and mattress. It's cosy, and the windows are always open at night, so the cold breeze could fill the whole room. I arranged some baby pillows around my daughter one night. Looking at her while she slept was so calming. I caught her smiling, and I wonder what she's dreaming. Me and my partner Ray have been working in the BPO industry for years. Our body clock follows our usual shift schedule, so it's always been pretty hard for us to fall asleep at night. It's 2am, and we're still wide awake, eating snacks while watching a movie we've seen a dozen times. We then talked about the most recent accident that had happened on the second floor of the building. A one-year-old kid had fallen down the stairs, damaged its head, fractured its bones, and was of course rushed to hospital. I told Ray how sorry I felt for both the parents and the baby. I then got up to grab a Marlboro Black from its box. It was empty. Realising that we had just run out of cigarettes, I had no choice but to buy some from the nearest store. And yes, at 2am, I dressed up in a white shirt and longer shorts. Our apartment was on the third floor, so I still had to go down the wooden stairs. I then went to the store, bought the cigarettes, and headed straight back home. Out of force of habit, I looked up at our unit as I walked past the cars in the parking lot just outside the building. I can see our terrace and front door. I then looked back down to watch my step, and when I almost reached the gate, I looked up again. There was this kid holding the terrace grill, so young and small. I even blinked to see if I'm seeing this right. Her dark black eyes were staring down at me. I panicked. It was my daughter. She must have gotten out of our unit. I rushed upstairs, my heart beating so fast that I can almost hear it. And when I got there, gone. She's gone without a trace. I walked slowly towards our unit's front door. I opened it, and there I saw my daughter, still asleep and in the same position when I left her. Did Althea get up? I saw her at the terrace, I asked Ray. He then looked at me with this puzzled look on his face and answered, What? Yeah, I just saw her, that's why I rushed in. The still puzzled expression on his face clearly answered my question. No doubt. I was about to go out to investigate, but when I reached the doorknob, that's when I realised. My daughter is eight months old. She still can't walk. And what's more, she can't possibly reach and turn the doorknob. The kid I saw was taller and older than my daughter. My heart was beating so fast. I knew what I saw. It was clear and solid. I couldn't say if she was pale white, but she's totally looking back at me with her shining black eyes. Just black. No pupil, no conjunctiva, just black. I didn't even wonder, because my daughter has long eyelashes and it was dark. But I was somehow relieved, and I think it's better to be something else than my daughter. And no, I know what you're thinking. The kid that fell down the stairs, recovered, and is still alive. Months later, it's about 7pm, and I was preparing myself for work. I took a quick selfie. The doorway in the terrace can be seen behind me in the photo. I soon uploaded it to Facebook and put it as my profile picture. Soon after I uploaded it, one of my closest friends posted a comment. There's a kid behind you. I looked at the photo again. I almost dropped my phone. The kid in the photo is the exact same kid I saw at the terrace, with those same black eyes. The Picture Frame by Curly Gurley This story happened when my family and I lived in a house that had a lot of paranormal activity. This is one of the many reasons we decided to move. I have a husband and two girls. My girls were pretty young at the time. I would say about four and eight. We had gone on vacation and were returning home. Upon arriving, we decided to get the girls in the bath and cook dinner. I was walking back and forth between the master bedroom and the kitchen. 
that's when I saw it. A picture of our youngest on top of our bookshelf had been completely turned around. Now, this wasn't like it had been tampered with and somebody had just put it back haphazardly. No, this picture frame was deliberately turned around to where the picture of my little girl was facing the bookshelf and the back of the frame was facing outward. Perfectly. I mean, it was neat, straight, placed back in perfect symmetry to the rest of the pictures and in the exact same spot, just completely backwards. When I saw it, it took my breath away. My beautiful baby, there amongst all the other pictures, but hers turned around. It seemed so dark. I tried not to overreact. I thought logically. Okay, obviously it was the kids. But the kids couldn't reach that high, not without a ladder, and they had not been on a ladder. I mean, I'm with them every single minute of every single day. Next would be my husband. I found him and brought him to look at the bookshelf. His reaction, he gasped as well. I don't think he meant to. He's not one to overreact. But, like I said, it just seemed dark. He said he didn't do it. And I mean, what motivation would a loving father have to do that to a picture of a child? I know it wasn't like that before we left for our vacation. It didn't take me long to spot it. It would have stuck out like a sore thumb. No one had been in our house either. We had a security system, so we literally knew no one had been in our house. We'd been feeling paranormal things for a while, and it had literally got to the point where I would shout and say, stop it, when something paranormal would happen. Pictures fell off the wall all the time. Footsteps could be heard all the time. My kids were crazy scared all the time. Dreams, visions, sightings, you name it, it happened. I began to think that whatever it was, it was targeting my kids, and I was ready to get the heck out of Dodge. This was my final straw. I finally talked my husband into it, and mixed with a few other things going on, we decided to sell. Since then, nothing. My kids are happy and aren't terrified. There have been zero paranormal issues, aside from the lights turning on twice, which could have honestly been caused by nearly anything electrical. My new house is peaceful. I never really realised how terrified I was in that old house until I got out. I'm so at peace here, it's amazing. Have you experienced anything like this, where your kids were targeted? I've always heard that places aren't haunted, people are. But that place is definitely haunted. I also forgot to mention that the people we bought the house from have a YouTube channel where they tell their own ghost stories about that house. We, of course, had no idea when we bought it. Hi guys, thank you so much for listening to today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to leave a like and also subscribe to the channel, making sure you hit that notification bell so that you never miss a video. Also, if you think other people should see this video, one of the best things you could do is share it online. It really helps the channel out and I would thank you so, so much for doing so. So, until next time, sleep tight.